the measurement systems analysis platform in Jump, the default is this EMP method. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about EMP, then we'll uh, we'll jump into um, the, the case study and kind of show you how to run through uh, an analysis in the, in the measurement systems analysis platform. So what is EMP? It's easiest to describe EMP, comparing it and contrasting it with the American, um, or the Automotive Industry Action Group, gauge r, &R criteria. If you've taken a class of quality, Six Sigma, or measurement systems analysis, you've probably heard the term percent r, &R. So percent R&R &R and the EMP uh, uses a different uh, classification method, the interclass correlation. It's probably easiest to understand the difference in the method by comparing these two. So this comes from uh, Donald Wheeler's uh, EMP3, evaluating the measurement um, uh, process and using imperfect data. It's a wonderful book. Uh, Clark's showing his too. <laughs> We both have many dog ears and bookmarks on it. It's it's truly a very good book at helping you learn how to use um, measurement data as well as perform effective measurement systems analysis. So let's talk about these criteria just a little bit. So I learned when I first did a measurement systems analysis that if I look at the ratio of the standard deviation of my um, gauge error compared to the total standard deviation, I get a percent. And that um, I want my uh, percent for a good gauge to be 10% or less. That's what we always shop for. Well, what I learned in my in practice in my career is that you can have very effective gauges that have a much lower percentage. In fact, Wheeler actually has a nice proof of percent R and R that it's actually mathematically incorrect to uh, use a ratio of standard deviations to to, to do this. So. Barring that aside, let's just talk specifically about the percentages. Are you going to go wrong using the AIAG method? No, you're not. Unless you get to a point where you're thinking about throwing away a gauge or trying to invest, you know, thousands to tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to improve a gauge, which was the case that I ran into. I had a gauge that uh, measured out at 30% R&R. Um, though it was actually a very effective measurement uh, tool in my industry. So all of the customers that I worked with, as well as other engineers that I worked with, had a lot of comfort with this gauge, and it was actually an effective way to develop products. This did not speak to the actual effectiveness that we were observing with the gauge, this percentage. So what I learned is if I measure the effectiveness of the gauge with this interclass correlation, which looks at a ratio of the variance of that part, the part variance compared to the total variance, but that's a much more effective way of looking at it. And in fact, um, the, I've got a little control chart simulation here. <laughs> and just to show that um, this is a data simulated on a 30% R&R uh, gauge. And if I go collect data and I actually truly have a one sigma shift in my process, that gauge with 30% R&R is still going to be able to detect a one sigma shift in the process. That's more what intuitively we were seeing with the gauge that we, we, we had that the study, the percent R and R part of the study was just contradicting us. It was just saying, hey, you know, if this isn't effective, you guys need to go spend tens of thousands of dollars to fix it. We'll wait. If we evaluate the data a little bit differently, it actually matches more with uh, what we found to be the case with uh, the tool in practice. So that's probably the big takeaway. Why should I consider using EMP? Well, consider it if you use gauge R&R &R and you're looking at a 30% gauge, just look at it a little bit different and ask yourself the question, are the data that my gauge collecting, are they capable of answering the business question that I'm after? I, I argue that interclass correlation and some of the statistics that are in EMP will help you understand that better than just this arbitrary 10%, 20%, 30% scale. Okay, just a quick run through on, on outcomes, and then I will spend the rest of the time um, in, in jump talking about um, how to do this. Interclass correlation, we already talked about that. It's the portion of variation attributed to the part uh, with and without bias factors. We'll talk about that. 
we also are interested in a variance components of, of the gauge. Fundamentally, all measurement systems analyses are variance components analyses. The figures of merit, like percent R and R and I interclass correlation, those are just things we get out of it. Fundamentally, this is the meat of what we're doing in a measurement systems analysis. Probable error is another thing that measurement system, the EMP method uses that I really like. So you, in the beginning, I was talking about my tape measure and how I uh, estimate you know, what I can report in terms of my measurements. Well, wouldn't it be better if we actually use data to answer the question about how many decimal places we report, what precision we report? Probable error and measurement increment are the, are the, the statistics that EMP method uses to help us report um, the, the, uh, the, the uh, precision of the instrument. It's not what the data sheet says on the, the, the instrument that you bought from, from whomever. It's after you do the study, let the data tell you what, what, what you need to report. And we'll show that in demonstration. All right, so for the fun part, um, this is something that it's, it's, it's simulated, um, but I love, I love cooking. I, I'm kind of a knife fanatic, a chef knife fanatic. And I was thinking about, you know, if I were a manufacturer of chef knives, um, uh, what might I do to um, uh, make a knife that performs well in, in a kitchen? Well, I think hardness is, is, a, is a physical measurement that has a relationship to how well a knife can hold an edge um, over time, as well as it may have some attributes uh, or some contribution into the type of edge that a knife can hold. Um, so my, my imagining, I'm thinking, hey, I'm a, a knife manufacturer, how do I measure that? Well, non-destructively, I can measure hardness with the rebound uh, test. This is great. I've used them a lot through my career. Of course, they have their limitations, so we better do <laughs> measurement systems analysis. So in our experiment, we have to consider the entire process. It, 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 isn't, it isn't just the, the, the measurement system itself that we're looking at. It's the entire process. So when I'm doing a rebound hardness test, there's an operator or a person involved in it. And I better have more than one knife in there so I can assess, you know, the, the, the repeatability and reproducibility of, of, the, um, of the measurement system as well. And in this case, how um, me as an operator, how I hold that rebound tester may influence um, the hardness measurement that I get. So I better include an interaction between operator and part. So let's take a look at the data table from that. It's the hardness MSA. Um, you can, in the DOE platform, there is a special purpose tool for MSA design. You can design your data collection plan in this utility. I would highly recommend it. It'll save you a lot of time. Um, but again, just like all designed experiments, it's nice to have a data collection plan. Jump can help you with that data collection plan. Always, 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 always randomize your measurement study. It really helps prevent um, biasing factors from popping up um, arbitrarily in your study. Uh, so this, this study has been randomized. And uh, let's load it up and see what EMP can tell us. Go to measurement systems analysis. We'll talk about that rounded here in just a second. Uh, so operator, um, so the, the, the knife is the part in this case. Operator I'm using as a grouping. Just recognize that any source of variation should be included here. So if you have um, something beyond operator, if you have like lab, facility, uh, different uh, devices, um, include those two. So that's the point of this is that we um, understand and, and uh, measure the amount of variation associated with all sources. In this case, we're just including um, knife and operator. Uh, range and standard deviation, um, range is default. Uh, standard deviation, um, Wheeler has some recommendations on this. Uh, range, if your uh, measurement system is a little more coarse, kind of like my tape measure, range method is a really good thing to do. If I'm looking at my laser range finder or possibly my digital caliper where my measurements are a little bit more refined, then standard deviation is a good method to do. So read, read his book if you want to know more details about it. Model type is crossed and we'll click OK. Let's just talk through, um, 
through what we're seeing here, I believe I want to go right kind of to the uh, assessment. And then I'm going to back up through some of these reports so we can see graphically what's going on with, with the gauge. Uh, let's turn on EMP results. Yeah, let's just turn on, for now, let's just, yeah, parallelism plots, bias comparison. Yeah, I, think that's, I think that's fine for now. If we have more time, I'll get into some of the other reports. Let's just uh, look at the figures of merit first. So the figure of merit, the interclass correlation, uh, with bias, bias is including the operator. So imagine I'm part of that bias. It has something to do with training procedure, um, but it's it has to do with how the operator is interacting with the measurement device. Um, so if I include all those um, bias, bias and the interaction between operator and part, I can see that 75% of the variation that I measured is associated with the part. Um, that's it's okay. Um, I might want that to be better. Uh, the uh, judgment uh, based on that figure of merit is that this is a second class gauge. And I have to consider what was it going to cost me if I want that to be a first class gauge? And really what am I giving up by continuing to use um, this gauge as a second class gauge? Um, the monitor class legend can help us out with that a little bit. You know, you saw me use a control chart. You know, I, you should ask the question, what change am I um, hoping to detect? And like Clark's example, um, where is my risk tolerance level right out near my spec limits? Ask those questions as you're answering the question about whether I need to improve my gauge. In this case, it's cheap for me to go back to my procedures and figure out a better way to do it. So I may do that and then do another round through measurement systems analysis. But let's just assume that we're going to use the gauge that we have. Next question is, is how many, how many uh, digits um, do I uh, report when I show the data? So let's look at the effective resolution report for that. And we're going to take a look at these measurement increment bounds um, that are a function of the measurement increment and the, the probable error. So these are like control limits on um, your uh, measurement precision. I'm using Clark. I'm using your words on that. Um, I really like that. It makes a lot of sense. But if we look at this lower um, and upper, upper, upper bound, what it's telling us is that I'm reporting too many decimal points of precision. Now, my rebound hardness test supplier may have set my readouts to read the three decimal point place precision. They may even say it's OK, but my data are not agreeing with that. My data are saying that I need to round uh, that number. So um, you can do that very simply by just creating a formula that rounds that. Um, the EMP report is saying, hey, just round it up to the nearest uh, Rockwell C um, hardness. Now, um, I would rerun um, the, the EMP report on um, that rounded measure and then relook at my effective resolution and say, okay, that's good. Now, when I report the precision of that hardness data, that is the precision level that I should be reporting. And I won't be misleading anybody by any decimal points beyond uh, what's absolutely effective. I would like to talk about just a couple graphical methods. So we talked about a couple of figures of merit that EMP uses that are very effective. Gauge r, r has their own figures of merit, too. They have their pluses. They have their minuses. You're not going to go terribly wrong using gauge r, r until you start looking at gauges that have higher percent r, and rs and you're thinking about whether you need to improve it or not. You have to ask yourself the question, is the data that I'm going to collect, is it going to help me answer my business question? And is it going to help me um, answer it in a way that mitigates risk? And if the answer is at 30% R&R, yes, continue using the gauge. Don't waste the money. Um, so just think about those things. I, percent R&R is not going away. It is overly conservative. Just understand where the limitations are and maybe how to answer those questions if you hit the limitations. All right, graphics. Let's talk graphics a little bit. I love graphics, um, especially when we're assessing gauges. This average chart helps me understand um, 
whether my gauge can detect change in my measurements. In this case, it's like a control chart, but I want all my points to be outside of the control limits. And that way I understand that my, my gauge can measure part to part variation. This is very similar to a, a variability or a multivary chart. So you can get the same chart through analyze, uh, quality and process, uh, variability attribute gauge. In fact, even here I could turn on the points and it would look very similar to um, those other those other reports. The standard deviation chart, it's giving us a, an assessment of how, um, how um, uh, whether our noise is consistent from operator to operator and point to point. And this one we want our, our points to be inside the control limit and they are. Another one that I really like graphically is this uh, parallelism plot. Um, parallelism plots, they also show up in the interaction uh, profiler, in the prediction profiler and uh, uh, fit model, um, and other places where the profiler is used. The way that you interpret these is any place where the lines are, are not parallel or is an indication of an interaction. So we do have some in indication that there could be an interaction between operator and part, so it probably has to do with how the operator is measuring the part. 